Okay, this week we're going to talk about Sabbath day or Sunday. What is the correct day to worship as a Christian? Now, if I could list the top five questions I've received in my years of being in ministry, definitely in the top five I would have had to list this thing of Sabbath day or Sunday. Um, and that usually comes from people who are either Seventh-day Adventists themselves or have been confronted by a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I've answered this thing and answered it and answered it and answered it because the answer is really not that difficult um, on which day you should worship. But uh, I decided, you know, maybe it's time I should just do a sermon on this subject, get a little bit more detail on it so that people can have, have this sermon out there to answer this question. So we're going to look at the King James Bible which the Seventh-day Adventists used to use, now they've kind of rejected for the new versions that come from the Vatican, even though they claim that they are very much against the Vatican and things like that, but uh, other story. But let's check this out here. First, we're going to go to the Seventh-day Adventists official website. We're going to read here, it says, United for Mission 150 Years, from Great Disappointment to General Conference. Okay, so... In 2013, they were celebrating their 150th year, so now they're up to 151 here in 2014. And I can tell you it's uh, amazing that this cult lasted that long. And they claim to have 18 million followers now, so that's pretty bad. But uh, it says here, The Millerites firmly believe that Jesus Christ's second advent, his second coming to earth, would occur on October 22, 1844. When his second coming did not take place, many Millerites were disillusioned and gave up belief in a literal second advent, but others went back to studying the scriptures. Over the next 15 years, former Millerites, meeting in a sequence of Bible conferences, identified a series of Bible truths forgotten since the days of the early church. Look out for that one. This stuff has been forgotten since the days of the early church. Uh, careful on that one. That's kind of one of the ways of a cult will do things. This has been a forgotten truth. No one's known about this now for years and years and years. I don't ever teach that, okay? I believe that Christians down through the centuries have always had the truth. Now, revelation, end times revelation, of course, things are going to be revealed, so certain scriptures are going to become more clear as time goes by. Obviously, somebody 100 years ago wouldn't have understood the mark of the beast being in the hand or in the forehead. That's why a lot of commenter, commentators back 100 years ago we're saying this has to be a mis mistranslation in the King James Bible. They should have stuck it out a little bit longer or just trusted the wording of the King James Bible. But, um, you know, so there is a thing of revelation making Scripture more clear, but I think the actual basic teachings of Scripture have been believed by Christians down through the last almost 2,000 years. You say, well, why don't I hear about it? Uh, well, because a lot of them were being persecuted, their writings were burned, and they didn't exactly have printing presses or internet ministries back then. I mean, you can't exactly find an external hard drive with all the sermons of the Pauliceans on it from the first century, you know, or the Waldensians. You know, there's a good book of, or there's a good library of the Waldensians literature that they wrote stored over there in Italy. Some the Waldensians were wiped out. The Pauliceans were wiped out. A lot of these early Christian groups, they were just called heretics. They're hunted down and killed by the Catholics, and their materials are burned. So it's not. This, you know, well, we found things now that, you know, people in the past didn't know. Uh, that's ridiculous. And by the way, just to refute this thing one last time, you know, one more time, I should say, because it'll never be the last time until the Lord raptures us out of here. But this thing that the rapture, pre-trib rapture, hasn't been taught before 1830 with John Nelson Darby, that thing has been, that lie has been repeated so much now people believe it's the truth. Uh, you can find writings, guys, back in the 2nd and 3rd century, you know, 4th century, I think, even, too, where they're talking about people being taken, the body of Christ being taken out before the time of Jacob's trouble, before this great tribu tribulation time period. Okay, the Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D. condemned a lot of the pre-trib rapture, pre-millennial beliefs as heresies. 431. So, don't fall for that lie that the rapture was not taught before 1830. All right, this Seventh-day Adventist stuff is new heresy, okay? I'm going to show you that. Christians weren't worshiping on the Sabbath day, like these nuts try to say. But here's the six things that they have adopted. That Christ's second coming is imminent and will be literal, not metaphorical, seen by all the world. That's true. Number two, that the seventh day, Saturday, not Sunday, is God's Sabbath, and the obligation to keep it is 
perpetual. Remember that. The obligation to keep the Sabbath day is perpetual. It's not something that ever was not to be done. It's perpetual from eternity past to eternity future. The whole time. That's what they're teaching right there. Seventh-day Adventist website. Number three, that God does not eternally torment sinners, but rather that the dead sleep until the second coming and last judgment. Absolute total heresy. What about the rich man in hell? Burning in torments. People don't have a clue. Number four, that Christ ministers in the heavenly sanctuary, thereby mediating to us the benefits of his death on the cross, saving us by his righteousness, not our own deeds. Wait a second. If you're supposed to keep the Sabbath day, then that's your own deeds. And they condemn those of us that worship on Sundays or any other day. You know, they condemn people that worship on Sundays. You're not really saved. Well, then, you know, then it is by your own deeds that you're saved, which is exactly what Seventh-day Adventists believe. They believe in good works for salvation. And they try to lie to you and make you think that, uh, oh no, it's by it's by grace through faith alone. You know, it's not of works. They don't believe that. Number five, that in the last days Christians will be tempted by apostasy, but will be called back to divine truth and the third angel's message of Revelation 14 by a small remnant of faithful believers. So they don't believe in a pre-trib rapture either. Big surprise. And number six, that the remnant would be marked by a recurrence of the prophetic ministry. In all this, they were guided by a young woman, Ellen G. White, who further to their sixth belief, they recognize as a prophet inspired by God. Huh. So you have a woman leading this cult. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. How's that work out? If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. How can you have uh, Ellen White, a woman, ruling both men and women? How does that work? It doesn't. But let's look at the law of first mention. Okay? Now remember, worshiping on the Sabbath is perpetual according to the Seventh-day Adventists. From their own website, I'm not making up, I'm not being slanderous or mean or nasty. Their own website, they said that the commandment of the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath day, that that is a perpetual commandment. So what was the law of the first mention there? When was the first time that the word Sabbath shows up in your King James Bible? Turn to Exodus chapter 16. Turn with my back to the wind here so I don't get my pages blown all over the place. Exodus chapter 16, verse 22 through 26. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath, there is the first time it appears, unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up until the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. There shall be none. Okay, so what's the very first time that the word Sabbath shows up? Right there, Exodus chapter 16. What's it a reference to? It's a reference to manna, this food that comes down from heaven and they're supposed to gather it for six days and if they try to keep it if they try to store it up gather too much it'll actually rot and stink unless it's gathered on the sixth day so it's a a miraculous spiritual food that god is making there that they can they can't store it up any day of the week other than 
there before the Sabbath day because on the Sabbath day, then they don't, they're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. So then their manna will last throughout the day. See? Is that what Seventh-day Adventists practice today? I mean, it's a perpetual thing, you know, right? So it should be the same, the same practice. You say, oh, that's a ridiculous argument. Well, it's a ridiculous thing to say that Christians have to keep the Sabbath day. And that it's always been perpetual. It's always been the same. Like the Seventh-day Adventist website said. Hmm. But we'll continue here. Next, go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Hmm. So you see there, just check something here quick. i check my microphone. Okay. So you see there that God rested the seventh day. Now what's the seventh day? That's the Sabbath day. So there you have it that it says right there, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which, he, which God created and made. Okay, so the seventh day is blessed and everything like that. It's a, it's a holy day and everything. Then why is it that the word Sabbath doesn't show up for another 2,000 plus years until Moses shows up after the flood and the days of Noah and all the other things? Isn't that kind of weird? You get the whole way through the book of Genesis, there's not one reference to the Sabbath day. But the Seventh-day Adventists said it was perpetual. If it's a perpetual celebration of the seventh day, then why is there no mention of anybody in the book of Genesis ever keeping it? 2,000 plus years, you could actually probably make it over 2,500 years, 2,500 years plus, and not one person keeps the Sabbath day until it's instituted by Moses. You say, well, it wasn't instituted by Moses. They were keeping it. They were keeping the Sabbath day. They just didn't mention it. Okay? It wasn't mentioned by name Sabbath day until the name came along. Right? Turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah, verse, Nehemiah 9, verse 13 and 14. Okay, it says here, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. You say, well, that happened there in the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, right? Keep reading. And commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant. Huh. So in other words, the first time that the Sabbath, the Holy Sabbath, is revealed, it's revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 16. So for 2,500 plus years, nobody kept the Sabbath day. That's a problem for you if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. And your organization comes out and says on its website that uh, it's been a perpetual thing. It's always been. People have always worshipped the saved, the truly saved, have always worshipped on the Sabbath day. That's a problem. Big problem. If I can open up the next page here. Next, go to Exodus chapter 20. But the problems only are just starting here for the uh, Seventh-day Adventist crowd. Exodus chapter 20. It 
verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt do, thou shalt uh, not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Where it for the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, just four chapters earlier, there you were told that God provided them with food that they could make. And then they're not supposed to cook anything on the Sabbath day. And we're going to see that as we continue. I wonder how many Seventh-day Adventists do that. Don't use anything. No work at all. Um, don't you drive to where your meetings are on Saturdays? And by the way, you know, just to make this point, and I'm not even going to get into all this stuff because this takes it in a whole different direction, but just to make it the point. Um, the Jewish calendar has 360 days in it. A Gentile calendar has 365 days in it. Um, so if you take that and you go back through the thousands of years, you know, back actually to Constantine when our calendar got mixed up and the pagan calendar was instituted and the Roman Catholic pagan calendar that we use now with Greek gods like, you know, months named after Greek gods and things. Um, if you would get rid of all that and go back to the actual Jewish calendar, you would see that the weekly Sabbath day doesn't even land on Saturday every day or every week. Sometimes it'd be Saturday, sometimes it'd be Sunday, sometimes it'd be Monday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, according to our pagan calendar. Okay? So again, if you want to make it that, that it's been a perpetual thing that we've never had a break in it, you've got a real problem because we aren't following the Jewish calendar. You see? So what might be the Sabbath day on the Jewish calendar could be Tuesday on the pagan calendar that we follow. Hmm. If it's a perpetual commandment, then you haven't been keeping it. No Seventh-day Adventist ever kept it for hundreds of years. Well, not hundreds of years. 151 years to be exact. So look out for that teaching. But uh, let's go next to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17. It says here, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you, Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Hmm. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of um, Ellen G. White. For, oh, wait a second. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. It is a sign between me and the children of the Seventh-day Adventist system. Uh, no, I read that wrong again. It says, uh, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Huh. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's, isn't that kind of a, a little bit of a confusing for our Seventh-day Adventist uh, people here? Because, you see, it's supposed to be perpetual. But for 2,500 years, nobody kept a Sabbath day. And when the Sabbath day finally shows up, it's only being done for the children of Israel. And what does the New Testament say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? The Jews require a sign and it says right there in verse, uh, or is it verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel. You say, that's ridiculous. 
every chapter in the in the book is mine. I every um, every every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, everything in the Bible belongs to us Christians today. Okay, so you're Israel. You say we're spiritual Jews. Um, okay, were they spiritual Jews back then or physical Jews? You say, well, they were physical, but they were looking forward to the spiritual. Uh, symbolically, they were spiritual then. because This, this non-dispensational stuff is so kooky and so nutty. I can't even relate to these people. They are workmen that need to be ashamed. But uh, let me ask you the other question a lot of Seventh-day Adventists don't apparently want to think about. And that is, do you mean to tell me that uh, every Seventh-day Adventist that's ever been has never worked on the Sabbath day? You say, well, I mean, we have to have some grace, Brian. I mean, you know, there might have been one Seventh-day Adventist that uh, worked on the Sabbath day. I mean, had to had a flat tire on their vehicle while they were driving to church, you know, or whatever, and they had to change it. I mean, there's no choice. I mean, you know, whatever. The Bible says they're to be put to death. Did you put them to death? You're keeping the Sabbath day, aren't you? You remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, aren't you? You wouldn't want to break the Sabbath day, would you? Kooky, nutty beliefs. Exodus chapter 35. Turn there next. Anytime you have a woman, I'm not cutting on women. Lord knows I don't, you know, do that in and malice and things like that. I mean, if you're a woman out there, you know, you need to understand what the Bible says, what you're supposed to do with your life. Don't get offended at me when I say, when I rip on some woman that's outside of the bounds of what God told her to do. And you get Ellen G. White up there, she's a prophetess, you know, and everybody's following her now. And the whole cult is formed on her teachings. It's ridiculous. Give me a break. Exodus chapter 35, verses 1 through 3 says here, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together, and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded, that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, on Saturday, every week, on Saturday, that's the Holy Sabbath day, on Saturdays you have to let your wood stove go out. And if you have a propane stove, don't turn it on because, hey, you're kindling a fire. might be with fuel, but see, it still work. And, it, you know, even electric stove, you really shouldn't turn that on. And they're following this? Of course not. They just pretend that they are, and they pretend that people that don't are somehow not saved. Kooky. Next, let's go to Numbers chapter 15. You say, well, Brian, I don't know. I'd, you know, okay, that stuff was kind of more like maybe ceremonial laws or something. Maybe they really didn't mean... When it says to kill somebody for working on the Sabbath, maybe it really didn't mean to kill them. It just probably meant, you know, that they get out of fellowship or something. Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36 says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, you know, like he was going to kindle a fire. And they brought, they that found him gathered, gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So yes, they did enforce the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath day. Do the Seventh-day Adventists do that. You say, well, things have changed. Hey, man, it's a perpetual thing. It's the Sabbath day from eternity past to eternity future. The whole time. Everybody always keeps the Sabbath day. Why not be doing it the same way? You see the problem this stuff gets you forced into? What about the New Testament? You say, well, what about the New Testament, Brian? You know, are there any commands for us to keep the Sabbath day? Well, let's look about that. Romans chapter 13, verse 9.
Romans 13, verse 9. Pages are really giving me fits today here. This wind. Romans 13, verse 9. Here Paul's given the Ten Commandments for the New Testament Christian or the commandments that we're supposed to follow. So you can be sure that Paul, as a Jew, would definitely say about keeping the Sabbath day. Okay? You can be sure of it because Paul was a Seventh-day Adventist, only not Seventh-day Adventist because they weren't founded until the late 1800s with, by a woman. But, you know, Paul certainly would have agreed with them, right? Romans 13, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wait a second. Um, hmm, I didn't see keeping the Sabbath day. That, that can't be right. Uh, yeah, uh, the Sabbath day is not in there. You know why? Because we're not supposed to keep it. Why? Because it's a sign to the children of Israel. And by the way, if you have an NIV, they take out the thing about thou shalt not bear false witness. They don't have any command to not lie. You've got to cover up for their own crimes, you know. But uh, the fact of the matter is, Paul, as a Jew, as a very well-trained Jew, leaves out keeping the Sabbath day. Why would that be? Turn over to Romans chapter 14. We're going to see why that is. Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. It says here, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Hmm. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's up to you, in other words. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth to the Lord, for he giveth, uh, for he, he that eateth, excuse me, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Hmm. So it's a matter of personal preference when you worship, not of commandment. How do you reconcile that if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you say that that's the whole big thing. Your whole system, your whole cult is named after that. The seventh day, the Sabbath day. What are you going to do about that? Hmm. And by the way, with that passage, it says, it's not saying you can't worship on Saturday every week. If you worship on Saturday every week and you're doing it as unto the Lord, go right ahead. Do it. But you see, the whole thing with the New Testament church that was designed there with that we we're still under the same rules and things it's meant to be flexible why because a rigid solid system can be persecuted much easier but when the body of Christ can be flexible when we aren't forced into holy temples to worship in and we aren't first forced on a certain days of the week from 9 to 12 in the morning and you know 6 to 7 at night or whatever else when we're not forced into that the body of Christ can be flexible. So you can go and you can meet with people on Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, whenever. See? We're going to see about that later too, when some of the early Christians were meeting. You say, but uh, you, you, Brian, you're a heretic. You, you're, you're way off here. This is ridiculous. You're not keeping the Sabbath day. You're not right with God. Right? Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Oh boy. If you have an educated Seventh-day Adventist right now, they're breaking out in sweat. Because they know that this verse really messes things up for them. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Hmm. The Sabbath days are a shadow of things to come. That's true. We're going to see about that here as, as we get through the study. But the fact of the matter is, 
you're not to judge anybody in regard to those Sabbath days. And of course, there's more than just the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. There are some holy Sabbaths under the Lord that yearly celebrations or a couple years or whatever, you know, that you read about back there in the Old Testament. But that's not the issue here. The issue here that the Seventh-day Adventists make the big deal about is the weekly observance of the Sabbath versus Sunday. And they try to tell you you're a heretic if you're worshiping on Sunday. I'm going to read some of their quotes here in just a little bit. But uh, it's a big problem when you have Paul saying, don't let anybody judge you when it comes to Sabbath days. Hmm. But you say, well, uh, you're still not proving it, Brian. Well, I mean, the, the early Christians certainly would have met on the Sabbath day, right? Let's check, check about that. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. You say, is there any scripture saying that we should meet on Sunday, the first day of the week? See, because if the Sabbath day is the seventh day, then that would mean the next day would be the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. Right? Is there any significance in scripture to the first day of the week? Mark chapter 16, verse 9. It says here, now when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week... He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Why wouldn't Jesus have raised up from the dead on the Sabbath day? Be a, a more holy day than the first day of the week, wouldn't it? You say, well, that's just Jesus rising from the dead. Okay, let's look at another reference here. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Okay, it says here, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Wait a second. Paul preached to him on a Sunday? And it was in the evening? Uh-huh. Yeah. He didn't preach to him on the Sabbath day. And uh, it wasn't that Paul was just in town for a special meeting. It was when the brethren came together on the first day of the week. They were meeting on Sunday. The Sabbath day, keeping the Sabbath day is a perpetual thing. It's always been perpetual. Sorry, Seventh-day Adventists, you don't know what you're talking about. Look at verse 11. Jump down there. Acts chapter 20, verse 11. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. So Paul preached Sunday night into Monday morning the whole way till break of day. The whole way till the sun came up. That's kind of an interesting service, isn't it? Well, then we should always do it that way. We should preach... We should get together, we should form it now, and we should preach every Sunday night from evening till Monday morning. That's the way it should be because it's forced right there. No, it's not forced right there. Because you go back to Romans chapter 14, Paul says, hey, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's not a big deal. When do you want to worship? When do you want to worship the Lord? You say Sunday morning. Go ahead. You say Saturday. Go ahead. Uh, Tuesday evening. Go ahead. Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. Go ahead. You see? You see, we have, this, we have this funny notion that church is supposed to be this weekly occurrence, this weekly social gathering, this little club that you go to, and everybody just kind of gets along and just has kind of fun and whatever else. Church is supposed to be the assembling of the saints. It's supposed to be for instruction, training you so that you can go out and get things done out there in the world. And if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the women are supposed to keep silent when the whole assembly is together. And if they want to learn anything, they're to ask their husband at home. What does that mean? That, mean that, that means that every saved husband has a responsibility to know the Word of God as good or better than the preachers that taught him. How often does that happen? Very rarely. Very rarely. The man sits back and he's like, oh, I want to watch my TV. You know, the wife says, uh, honey, I got a question about the Bible. Call the preacher. I don't care. Oh, whatever, you know. 
the church buildings make Christians lazy. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's continue. You say, are there any other references to Christians meeting on the first day of the week? I was hoping you'd ask that. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So they're taking up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem on the first day of the week. Not the seventh day. Hmm. You'd think that a perpetual order, a perpetual day like the Sabbath day, you'd think that they'd be a little bit more careful about uh, keeping it if it was this forced thing. But it's not forced. Hmm. And it's interesting because the Seventh-day Adventist system has really backed off on this one too. You see, the old-time Seventh-day Adventists, including their cult founder, Ellen G. White, actually taught that Sunday worship was the mark of the beast. Oh yeah, so I don't believe it. Here are the quotes. Sunday keeping must be the mark of the beast. The reception of his mark must be something that involves the greatest offense that can be committed against God. So worshiping on a Sunday is the greatest offense that can be, wor that can be committed against God. Well then, Paul and the early Christians were guilty according to old Ellen G. White here. Hmm. The Marvel of Nations, Elder U. Smith. Sorry, it was Elder Smith there. Page 170 through 183, but Ellen White says the same thing. Here she says, Ellen G. White, The Mark of the Beast, page 23. She says, quote, Here we find the mark of the beast, the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday on the part of the Catholic Church without any authority from the Bible. I just read you the scriptures. Ellen G. White didn't know what she was talking about. She tried to say it was the Catholic Church that changed it to Sunday. No, they were worshiping on the first day of the week in the Bible. Another one here, quote, The Sunday Sabbath is purely a child of the papacy. It is the mark of the beast. Advent Review, Volume 1, Number 2, August 1850. So you go back to the old-time Seventh-day Adventists, they were a lot more clear. They weren't as deceptive as the modern ones. They try to say, oh, no, it's not works that leads to salvation. The old ones believed it. They say, oh, it's, uh, worshiping on Sunday is not really the mark of the beast. But the old ones believed it. Hmm. One more quote here. Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, Volume 4, page 281. She says, quote, The change of the Sabbath is the sign or mark of the authority of the Romish Church. The keeping of the counterfeit Sabbath is the reception of the mark. Hmm. Well, that's interesting, because if you read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, it says anybody that takes the mark and worships the beast goes to hell and burns, and they have no chance of being forgiven. So that means some of the greatest Christians down through history, including Paul and the early Christians there in the book of Acts, they're all in hell right now. They all received the mark of the beast, even though there was no Antichrist to be connected to taking the mark and worshiping the beast. You see how messed up this system is? Seventh-day Adventism is a joke. How in the world did 18, 18 million people become ensnared to this pathetic cult? What a shame. Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. You say, well, uh, is there going to be anything about the Sabbath day in the future? Well, actually, I do believe that there is. Say, so wait a second, wait a second here. You're contradicting yourself. No, no. Stick with me. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? I'm not worried about uh, breaking the Sabbath day. Who would be? Uh, well, probably somebody in Judea. Like it says there in Matthew chapter 24, verse 16. 
Matthew chapter 24, written to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, not to Christians. You say, do you believe that the Sabbath day is going to come back? Well, as the world shifts from the Gentiles to the Jews, I believe that the Jews are going to be worshiping on the Sabbath day. Their real Sabbath day, not like the Seventh-day Adventist thing, you know? Hmm, interesting. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Say, what's the importance of this whole thing of, of uh, Sabbath day versus Sunday? What's the importance of it? Let's read here. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. How many days did it take the Lord to create the earth in Genesis? Six. What did he do on the seventh day? He rested. By the way, God did create the world in six days. Not uh, that there was a gap between the first part of Genesis. That gap theory is a bunch of nonsense. God created the world in six days. Not that he created it and then he messed up and then he had to recreate it again later on. That's nonsense. Evolution. Ridiculous. The world was created in six days. God rested the seventh day. Well, then what's that do for the first day of the week? Let's keep reading. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. All this good stuff is going to be destroyed, like I've talked about in other studies. Verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hmm. So let's think about this. You have six days... God made heaven and earth. Six days. Do it this way. Six days, God made heaven and earth. The seventh day, he rested. What happens at the seventh day, after the seventh day, the millennial kingdom? What happens? The earth is destroyed, and eternity begins on the first day of the week. Hmm. Interesting. Jesus uh, rose from the dead on the first day of the week. How do you get eternal life? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, if Jesus died on the cross and was buried and stayed dead and buried, would we have anything? No. We'd be no different than the Muslims or the Buddhists or the whatevers, Hindus, Brahmas. Taoists, whatever. Their uh, gods, their leaders died and stayed dead. You can go visit their graves. There isn't any grave of Jesus Christ. He came up. He was resurrected on the first day of the week. So our eternal life begins on the first day of the week. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? So to worship the Lord on the first day of the week uh, really probably isn't that bad of a deal. And it's certainly not taking the mark of the beast. Okay? That's absurd. That is absurd to the highest degree. That's why the Seventh-day Adventists have dropped that belief. Now you have some of the radical ones that still hold to it, still try to say that, oh, it's, you know, whatever, whatever. But the ones that have any sense will abandon that ridiculous nonsense that worshiping on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Please, give me a break. That's nonsense. No, the fact of the matter is, brethren, that uh, you don't have to worship on Saturday. And there's nothing wrong with worshiping on a Sunday. In fact, I would say that it's very holy uh, to worship the Lord on Sunday. But you know it gets worse with me? You say, what are you talking about? I believe it's very holy to worship the Lord every day of the week. 
I don't need to go to some building someplace to worship the Lord. I can worship the Lord wherever. I mean, my wife and I, we read the Bible every day. You know, we listen to the Bible, listen to the Bible all night long, you know, while we're sleeping. We we're, have the Bible plan, you know, Alexander Scorby recordings. And uh, that's been really, really good. Um, definitely cleared up some of the weird dreams that we both were having and things. And, and like I talked about in my, you know, physical encounter encounters with the spiritual realm study, um, you know, playing the, the Bible at night, if you're having really messed up dreams and spiritual attacks and whatever else, it's a good idea to get into that. King James Bible, of course, don't mess with the others. But, uh, you know, we worship the Lord all the time. Uh, there's never a day that goes by that we don't talk about the Lord. Uh, to us, it's it's not a, okay, we got to set aside this day of the week to worship the Lord. Uh, oh, man. Uh, you know, oh, well, at least we'll get to see our friends at the Babel building that we attend. That isn't it. What we want is we want a real, true relationship with Jesus Christ that never ends. You know, I don't I don't love my wife on one day of the week show her love and affection and talk to her on one day of the week and then I have six days off or five days off when I go in for two hours for a prayer meeting or something. What kind of a relationship would that be? I love my wife, I love my wife, excuse me, I love my wife seven days a week, you know, and uh, we talk. We have a good relationship. I thank the Lord for that. You say, well, then it's always been perfect. No, we've had some rough times. We've had arguments. We've had problems and things. We're not perfect. Uh, nobody's perfect. You're going to have those times when you are married. But the fact of the matter is, you wouldn't have a very good marriage if you only spent time with your husband or wife, depending on what you are, only one day a week. See, the assembling of the saints has gotten away from the original intent of the Bible. The original intent of the Bible is to instruct you, to train you, so that you can go out and you can witness to other people. And you go out and you get somebody saved and you say, okay, I'm going to go meet at such and such person's house because i got to teach them the Bible. You see, the idea, the way that this thing is perpetuated, and I say this thing, I mean Christianity, okay, the way that you get Christianity to grow and to move out and things is that you get saved and then you get a bun among a bunch of Christians and they teach you the Word of God and they instruct you in the things of Scripture and I do believe in, in, you know, a system of elders. I believe at first maybe you might not have a bunch of men that are qualified, so maybe you'll just have one single pastor. Okay, fine. But his job should be to bring other men up to his level, you know, so that he can trust these other men, faithful men who he can commit things to, and he can say, hey, brother, could you, go, you live nearer to this person? Could you go over there and talk to them? Here's, here's a Bible. Take this Bible over and teach it to them. You know, well... Can I be in regular fellowship? No, no, you can't because you got to teach that person over there. You go meet with them any day of the week. Oh, but we have to meet on a perpetual uh, Sabbath day. No, you don't. Go meet with them. The only day it, it suits them is Tuesday. Then go meet with them on Tuesday and teach them the Word of God. Raise that person up. Now when they can go and they can assemble with the other saints and they can organize and they can say, okay, hey, you just they, they come over and they say, excuse me, um, I don't really know your names yet. A brother, so it's, oh yeah, Brother John, Brother brother Phil. Um, I just heard you talking about putting out tracks and, and you need a place to print tracks. I just joined this group. You didn't know this, but I'm actually, I, I have a print shop. I know how to print tracks. I can print as many as you want. Really? Wow, that's great. Let's work on this. See, that's the purpose of the body of Christ. Not to get together in these social clubs and these social gatherings and, you know, get in with the in crowd, you know, the pastor and his special little in crowd, and you go to eat at his house and things like this. This system is so messed up, it's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. You know? I mean, I, I saw something here, um, some Amish in this area up here in northeastern Maine, and they're not like the Amish that I was raised around. These are different Amish. And I, I was actually talking to the two different of these of the brothers there and um, very much interested in the things of the Lord and, and uh, very much into the house church movement. And, uh, and 
very much open to talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, not, a, not ashamed of him like the Amish from Lancaster County where I'm from. And it was really interesting. I can't say yes or no to them being saved yet. I, I didn't hear the testimony or anything, but the point is uh, very open to the things of the Lord. And interestingly, the second time I went back to this place, the brother that I was talking to the first time actually had had a house fire. And that whole congregation of Amish people was there, you know, 40, 50 men there working on the house. All the women out there working on things, cleaning stuff out and everything else, they don't have insurance, you see. So if something goes wrong, the whole community pitches together. That whole group of people pitches together. That's the way things are supposed to be, brethren. Okay, that's New Testament. And this modern Bible building system where you have, instead of having, you say, well, Brian, that, that cost a huge amount of money. Where would we get all that money? Well, here's an idea. Don't waste it on things like uh, half a million dollar Bible buildings. I mean, there's a thought. You know, maybe if the body of Christ didn't waste their money on Bible buildings and actually just kept it around to help other people. You get together and you say, hey, there's a whole big community over here that hasn't had the gospel preached to it yet. Let's buy tracks. You know, house church I used to be part of, we actually had a, a thing where at first we would collect money and a little offering box thing there and stuff like that. And, and uh, then if we had needs, you know, tracks or DVDs or whatever else we were putting out, getting out to people, uh, you know, we would take that money and somebody would deposit in their bank account and then they'd go and they'd buy it or whatever. And it got, just got to the point where it's like, well, that's kind of has its own issues. So what we started to do is we had lists of things that people could buy that we needed. Bibles to send to this guy over in Africa, or we needed tracks for this upcoming outreach, or we need this, or we need that. And somebody could come to the deacon there and he could say, hey, in private, I'd like to take care of that thing on the list. Okay, we need uh, $250 for that. Okay, there you go. Check cash, whatever. See? There are ways to do it. But what we do is, what many Christians have done now for centuries, is you go out and you get yourself mortgaged into this huge big building, half a million dollar property or more. I've been in Babel buildings that are a million dollars or more. You know, I mean, look it up online sometime. Look it up in your area. Um, used churches. You'd be amazed at the prices of these places hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars oftentimes. And they're not even that big of places. You get these real big mega Babel buildings, they're, they're up into the multi-million, 15, 20 million dollar buildings. It's insane. But you know, people build these huge big buildings and then everybody's tied to the thing, strapped to it financially. And then you go and it's a social club and you gotta have spaghetti dinners and fun events and vacation Bible schools and whatever else to keep the interest up. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And Seventh-day Adventism is just another one of these cults. Just another one of these things that they have been lying to people for a long time and they've ensnared a lot of people. 18 million people. <laughs> Incredible. And, you know, do the numbers. You get 18 million people, you know, faithful members, and you can get some money from them. You make good money. See, that's why the house church movement is superior to the whole Babel building movement because you keep your numbers small. You keep the body of Christ spread out, doing the work in their own community, not having to come move places so they can attend a good local church. See? I'm going to be doing a lot more on the house church movement here coming up because it's really becoming obvious to me that I need to do more. I'm going to be redoing my uh, How to Start a House Church uh, based on the King James Bible video series. I'm going to be doing a lot more on that going to be doing some house church FAQs. Uh, there's just a lot that I need to get done on that. So please, um, if you have any suggestions, uh, questions that you have, um, that's, I'll, I'll just throw this out here right now. Um, if you have any questions that you have on the house church movement, um, different ideas or thoughts or whatever else about house churches, put them down in the comments section there or send me a, a private message, whichever one you want. Um, send it to me and I'll try to answer it in our FAQ section. Uh, frequently asked questions, in other words. So, but anyhow, kind of got off topic a little bit there, but the fact of the matter is 
teaching that you have to be forced to worship on the Sabbath day completely without Scripture. It's not there. Unless you're a non-dispensational and you go back and you steal from the Old Testament and you don't show in the New Testament where it's just like, no, don't even worry about it. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. See, watch out for these cultists, people. If you meet a Seventh-day Adventist, don't let them talk you out of your faith. And don't let them, if you meet a really radical one and they're trying to tell you that you're taking the mark of the beast because you worship on Sunday, say, did Paul take the mark of the beast when he worshiped on Sunday? You know, show them there in Acts chapter 20. But anyhow, that's going to be it. Um, I guess we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I just, I long for the Sabbath of rest, Lord, that we have coming in our future. The millennial kingdom, Lord, after the second coming, after you come back down to this earth. And more than that, Lord, I, I look forward to the rapture. When you finally take us out of here and all your saints are united. And uh, just really, really looking forward to that. And um, when the body of Christ can finally be together and we can see those who have gone on before, Lord, and, and uh, just meet them in the, in the air and, and then meet you face to face for the first time. Uh, what an amazing future we have ahead of us, Lord. And I just pray that all of us would keep that in mind and stay focused on our eternity, on the future. And um, I just pray, Lord, that if there are any Seventh-day Adventists that have made it through this whole study here, I just pray, Lord, that they would get out of that system because it's more, it's a lot more than just a Sabbath thing. Uh, there's a whole lot of problems with that system. And if there are any Bible believers out there that are trying to be, that Seventh-day Adventists called us or trying to con them out of their beliefs, I pray that the Bible believers would just not even listen to them and just show them from the Scriptures that they're wrong. And I just pray, Lord, that we would all be busy about your work and the time that we have. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that's going to be it. Uh, really beautiful day out here. It's kind of funny how things work out because... Um, I, initially I was planning to come out here and do these sermons and uh, it was like oh, it's going to look really good you know it's supposed to be sunny real nice day and then I got up this morning and it was like oh man you know it's cloudy and overcast and foggy and, and I thought there is that idea you know because I like to be out here it's, it's I, I always feel more energetic when I'm out here than, than sitting inside the studio um but, uh, you know, it started getting sunnier and sunnier, and I'm looking out the window going, hey, maybe I can do it outside. So <laughs> kind of last minute type of a deal. I threw all my materials in and, and uh, you know, hopped in the truck and headed over here. So I'm going to have a better setup eventually here. Um, we're still having issues with the road. <laughs> Everything looks real good. I drove up. A lot further up to the property this uh, past week but now my neighbor says that he wants to put in some more culverts into the bridge area here and so he knows what he's doing so I'll trust to ju his judgment but uh, it's getting kind of old you know haven't been able to get back to the property and do any work back in here and uh, so, I mean I'm, I got plenty to do at the ministry headquarters so it's not a real huge deal but still it just kind of bugs me but um, please keep us in your prayers concerning that um, we're very anxious to be able to to uh, get back to the land that the Lord gave us and um, start living back there uh, very very anxious for that and it just is really really going slow and I, I you know, the Lord has his reasons I mean Romans 8 28 you got to keep that stuff in mind but um, just appreciate your prayers and uh, Thank you, of course, to everybody that donates to the ministry. Again, we can't do this without you. And I, I am going to be doing another video here coming up. Don't want to spoil the surprise too much, but uh, just kind of funny. I, I was uh, attacked recently by this cultic woman, you know. And, and yeah, again, I, when I say woman, I'm not speaking derogatorily towards a lot of you sisters out there. Because, I mean, some of the best comments I have on my videos a lot of times are coming from my sisters in Christ. So I do appreciate you, and I'm not cutting on women when I say this, but, you know, you get these women, and they're speaking definitively, and they've come out, they've been called of God to rebuke Brian Denlinger. You know, it's always funny. 
And uh, <laughs> this one crazy nut was like saying that this is all a green screen. And you, you, know, you hear the wind and you hear birds and you see bugs flying around. It's all in a studio. I'm conning people out of their money. Um, wouldn't it make more sense to actually videotape outside, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is all a green screen here, huh? Okay, well, let me, let me, let me grab a, a rock here from the, uh, this is from the studio. You know, I have this. This is all pre-planned, okay? You know, see the rock? See how there's dirt on it and stuff, you know? And it's, it's on my hand, you know, and stuff like that, you know? I mean, see this, see this rock? You ready? Now watch this. I'm going to throw it right into the green screen over here, and I'm going to time it so that my graphics editors in my multi-million dollar studio, they can time it so that they can animate the rock hitting the water. You ready? You ready? Watch this. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That, that scene right there cost us $50,000 to shoot that. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible the way people attack me it's just like you got to be kidding me I mean you know I got a system right now I got my camera sitting on the tripod right there with a shotgun mic on top I got a microphone here on my side I got the little lapel mic that goes to this thing because I want to back up so my audio audio doesn't get messed up anymore I mean I'm out here on on a lane you know that leads back to my property I mean why on earth would I try to set this up in a studio? You know? <sighs> but anyhow, I'm, I'm going to be doing some videos, you know, coming up with some, maybe some little bit of humor type of stuff, you know, showing some of the weird comments I've gotten over the years. I mean, I've, I've gotten some doozies, let me tell you. So, uh, again, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but I'm going to have some fun here coming up. So... I think that's going to be it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Not sure what we're going to be preaching about next week, but it'll be a, another topic. I try not to cover the same thing. You know, sure, you're going to have verses and scriptures that are going to overlap, but I always try to have some new question that's answered. Uh, you know, I can't stand this thing. There again, a lot of the Babel buildings, you have these guys coming around that preach there, and, and uh, you know, they, they have like, 30 sermons and they preach the same thing over and over and over again it's just you can't come up with anything new man i mean the lord can't show you anything new from this from his word and from the world things that are going on whatever i guess i just don't understand that but uh well i'm gonna quit yapping now so we will see you next week and i have some special studies coming up and uh some other things so please keep us in your prayers